Have you guys heard Hardy's new song, Quit? Somebody wrote quit on a napkin. I took it out of my tip jar laughing. Like, damn it came out a few weeks ago, and I feel like the internet's collective response was, oh, Hardy has discovered NF. What's my definition of success? Because the song is a super sincere rap-ish song that's mixed with this really kind of anthemic rock music. So before you choose, hey, get to know a guy. He might end up a poet that was born to fly. And it's a far cry from the straightforward country rock that Hardy was giving us in the beginning of his career with stuff like redneck or, or unapologetically country as hell. And it continues the storyline of Hardy's schismed musical identity that he really initiated on The Mockingbird and The Crow, an album whose whole point is that there are two sides of Hardy. In the song, Hardy is reflecting on someone who once put a note inside of his tip jar and they wrote, quit on a napkin, and that created a chip on his shoulder that drives him to keep making music. Hardy's actually told the story of this before on stage when he was winning a big songwriting award for ACM Honors. We might have made $10 in tips, but one person wrote quit on a napkin and they put it in that tip jar. And tonight, that quit napkin will be sitting right beside this And in the song, Hardy kind of details his rise from writing with Florida Georgia Line to getting on a track with Morgan to starting to rack up hits to then breaking out of the mold that he felt like he had set for himself. Maybe I'm just petty, cause they're just metal. Wait, then again, so am I. He even references the really horrible bus crash that he was in last year and kind of the idea that he's gonna do what he wants now. The reaction to this song, I wouldn't say has been especially positive. It's not like when Hardy dropped weight in the truck and everyone on the internet just kind of agreed, we love this. This one's pretty polarizing. A lot of people are like, eh, this is a bridge too far and it feels kind of lame. And a lot of Hardy's more diehard fans are like, this is awesome, do whatever you want, man. And I'm kind of ambivalent about the song personally. Like I admire whenever an artist does something that's a little bit annoying. I think that's way cooler than being boring. But at the same time, as much as Hardy is doing something new musically here, I feel like lyrically, I've heard this narrative from Hardy now a bunch of times. The idea that Hardy can't just be confined to one genre and can do whatever he wants is the plot of Sold Out. And the song Mockingbird and the Crow and Radio Song. Gotta make them tap their feet or I lose my record deal. Makes it feel not that exciting to me on this track when he's like, oh, they're just metal, but so am I. And it goes into a whole breakdown. Now I'm just like, yeah, I accept that you can do what you want musically. Like, I'm not offended by this anymore. But the song in response is like, take this, watch what I do next. And I'm still just like, yeah, okay. But the bigger thing that the song made me think about was the curse of self-awareness that I feel like is upon Hardy and so many artists. Hardy is so aware of where he has come from in the industry and his role in the industry, that he is almost more shackled by it than I feel like he is even empowered by it. And I do not think that's a unique experience to him. That happens to a lot of other musicians and just people in general. And it's such a double-edged sword to truly know thyself because you understand why you're operating in a certain way and yet sometimes you are kind of committed to doing that. And I think that feeling can come across extremely personal and sometimes a bit self-centered, which is not that crazy because you gotta have some degree of ego to make music and say, hey, what I have to say matters for other people to hear. Like all art is a little narcissistic. But listening to Quit just got me thinking so much about other examples of artists kind of doing this. The most obvious example in the musical landscape is probably Taylor Swift. You can go all the way back to Taylor Swift's third album when she released the song, Mean. You, with your words like knives and swords and weapons that you use again. Responding to a bad review she got once. And even though she was fighting back against this review, clearly she was in her head about it. On her next album, she had a cheeky line about how, oh, he's probably listening to some indie record that's much cooler than mine. With some indie record that's much cooler than mine. On the following album, she released Shake It Off, a song entirely about her haters and the way that she's going to move past the hate. Got nothing in my brain. following album was literally all about her reputation. And it was a solid five years where this was kind of 
Taylor's obsession. It was all music about her perception. And there was something very fascinating about watching someone almost responding to the perception of her with her own music. And there was this kind of meta dance happening. But it also annoyed a lot of people. Like I remember at the time when all of those albums were coming out, people were like, oh my gosh. You gotta move on and just sing about anything other than this. And obviously this has all worked out fine for her. It actually looks kind of cool in hindsight that she was pushing back so hard on her own reputation. But that's a difficult balance to strike. Another band that came to mind for me was Mumford and Sons. But it was not your fault but mine. And it was your heart. After they blew up with Sy No More and had songs like Little Lion Man and I Will Wait. And I Mumford was sort of teased for being this stomp and holler, quiet, loud, quiet, loud type of band that just sort of lame, suspender-snapping faux hipsters were listening to. And I remember when they were getting ready to release their third album where they brought in electric guitar, they started doing all of these interviews that were saying, oh, we hate the banjo, we didn't mean to become the loud banjo band. They made that Hopeless Wanderer music video that was kind of lampooning this whole scene. And I remember feeling like, damn, your critics got to you. You became too aware of your own identity in the media and now feel the need to defend yourself when you were selling out arenas. We've talked about Zac Brown Band and the whole saga of the owl and then Zac Brown's The Controversy a million times. Sitting on a runway, all I want is you. Can't wait to get my hands on. But he was another guy that clearly felt restrained by expectations of the art he was supposed to make. You release a record on iTunes, you have to pick a category. One category. You can't say country, rock, reggae, soul, and whatever. No, you get one bucket. You could argue the band Perry was feeling the same way when they released The Comeback Kid. I but it is really damn hard to make interesting music about this internal struggle because I think it can become a little bit unrelatable to a normal listener. Or maybe just for lack of a better word, annoying. And I'm not speaking from any place of authority. Anyone that watches this channel knows I have all of my qualifiers that I'll always say before certain things where it's like, I know I'm the guy that took down snap tracks and I know I said this about this album, but now I feel this way. And for the most part, no one is holding me to that rigorous standard of like, Grady, you're not allowed to evolve and change. You need to say the same things you always say. That's like 0.1% of commenters though. It feels always like 50%. So I relate to what some of these people are doing as a creator. If you listen to Hardy on Troy Cartwright's 10 year podcast he talks all about how he literally studied songwriting i went to i do i have a degree in songwriting from mtsu I, not a lot of people know that Dang. but um and how he learned to perfect the craft of it it almost feels to me like this is a preamble to him wanting to break out and for him there's something cathartic about breaking rules that he used to feel so bound by in a way that just sort of writing normal music for country radio feels like a chip on his shoulder and again i relate to that like, I cannot be a normal person about legacy media having been in it. Having been trained in the regular magazine world, you're never gonna catch me not shading it and not being like, well, now I can do whatever I want on YouTube and I have my own platform and they suck. And I'm probably overcorrecting, but that's what we do. And Quit also reminded me of a whole batch of other songs that are sort of self aware industry protest songs or something. Music that's talking about the music industry. And country music loves to do this, usually in the format of Nashville is ruining country music, whether that's Murder on Music Row by George Strait and Alan Jackson, or Dispatch to 16th Ave by Muscadine Bloodline. I know a few of those highway men are probably shaking their heads above. Or Fence Post by Aaron Watson. Rather be an old fence post in Texas than the king of Tennessee. Or Cold Damn Vampires by Zach Bryan. But then there's also songs like Love Song by Sarah Bareilles, a track that she wrote in response to her label telling her, you need to write a love song or we're not putting out this album. So she was like, I'm not gonna write you a love song. And they were like, all right, that's good enough that we're gonna put that out as a single and release your album. Same thing with Weezer's Pork and Beans. Where they're like, we're gonna do what we want. 
we're not gonna make anything just because you tell us to make it. The irony being the label told them they needed to make a better single. In small doses, I love songs like this. A reputation song like Live in the Dream by Morgan Wallen or like Rumors by Lindsay Lohan even. Those are interesting as a one-off, but if you hit that beat too many times, it does start to put some distance between me and the artist. And that's a little how I felt listening to Quit. Now, I wonder if this is gonna be like one of those lead singles from Eric Church, where he'll put out the outsiders, it'll get a lot of buzz, and then it'll just flop, and then he'll put out Give Me Back My Hometown, and it'll smash. But it successfully rebranded the era in an interesting, provocative way. And sometimes that's what a lead single does, and I wonder if that's the plan with Quit. Like, oh, we're entering this kind of like, mental health empowered era and we're going to get something that sounds a little more familiar to us with hit potential with whatever's next but if nothing else i feel like quit is a true look into the mind of an artist someone that is tortured by the expectation that others have of him or more likely tortured by the expectations that he puts upon himself and doesn't know any other way to deal with them but to create something out of that angst and i suppose that's the rub of artistry like you gotta be a little crazy, a little in your head, and then you gotta take it out of your head and give it to the people that are in their heads. And I guess that's all of life. That's all of communication when you really boil it down. Maybe that's what this video is. I don't know, it's one of the more disorganized videos I've ever made. I have a hundred notes on this piece of paper about this song and other songs, and I don't even know what it adds up to, but that was my video about Hardy and the curse of self-awareness. But I'd love to know what you think of the song, if you like it, if you're not excited about it, if you think it's bad NF, if you think it's actually really good. The question on the table is obviously not, is this song country? So we don't even need to have that debate, but say what you will in the comments below and I'll see you soon with more music stuff. Bye.